Welcome to the Women and Wealth Podcast with Esther Sabo. Esther is a respected leader in the field of personal financial advice with over 25 years of experience. After going through her own significant and challenging life-changing events, she overcame fear and self-doubt to launch her own successful advisory firm. Now Esther is ready to share her practical and personal experiences to help other women clear their hurdles and brave life's transitions. In this way, she inspires women to lead fulfilling and confident lives. Hello and welcome to Women in Wealth with Esther Sabo from Gates Pass Advisors. Today, it's part two. Part two of a podcast where Esther brought in EJ Hong as a special guest. And EJ is a certified specialist in estate planning, trust and probate law by the State Bar of California Board of Legal Specialization. Welcome back to the show, EJ. How are you? Good. Thank you. Good to be back. Wonderful. Esther, thank you so much for bringing her back. Oh, we're having such a good time. It's been, it's great to talk with EJ about estate planning. It's, it's unbelievably fun. And I imagine her clients experience uh, a surprising amount of enjoyment when they're working with EJ too. No, I'll be honest. I had never met EJ before the the first podcast, which if you have not heard that, please go back and listen to it. You, You told me that you were bringing in an attorney, uh, and I thought, okay, this will be a great podcast information wise, but actually it was fun. And I, I, I didn't <laughs> I expect you. fun, but uh, no, you guys definitely brought it uh, on the last podcast and it was, it was a really good time with a ton of great information. So where are we picking up today? Well, last time we talked a lot about women going through divorce or considering divorce and where estate planning fits in. And there are some great tips there if you haven't heard it. Today, we're talking more about transitions that involve marriage or remarriage, as well as business success, Mm. and even some about single women and same sex. So we're going to try and fit it all in, but we're going to start where we left off last time, which was how important it is to do something very simple that you don't even need an attorney for, and that is checking your beneficiaries. But when do you really want to bring in the attorney. EJ, how come it's so important to check beneficiaries on life insurance, IRAs, retirement plans? So let me just go back to what is uh, probate. And probate is a court process and it's a court supervised process. And so if you die without a will, and the technical term for that is intestate, or if you die with a will alone, and that's if you die testate, uh, then the, uh, the uh, your assets will go through the probate court process. In California, the the fees are uh, for high for probate court. It's about five to seven percent of the estate. It also, is public. So I don't know if you know of this famous case that I have, and that is regard to it has. Uh, I'm uh, the probate lawyer for the house that had radioactive material oh, in it. Yeah, their ura- exactly. Their uranium. I was shining. <laughs> and uh, what and, do you mean it was so tell for those who aren't familiar to so, say a little bit more about it? So anyway, so the decedent died. He had great uh, uranium in his house and he had a will alone. And so um, in, in any event, uh, when when the the organizer found the, that there were signs that said radioactive materials and then they saw this yellow stuff in in the shed outside. She called the county, and so then the county called. I mean, they they got hysterical, and so then the county um, called the the city. The fire truck came out, uh, tore down. You know, they they uh, broke down the house. I mean, the door and went inside and captured what they thought were the all the radioactive materials. We had to have the state come in, the EPA, and so it was just uh, it was just wild ride. Anyway, so. The, the the will had to the, so it was public. What I'm what I'm trying to get to in, in that long story was is that it was all it was public and everybody knew what his assets were and who his who his heirs are and so everybody it gets in and also there will be fees associated with it. So a way to avoid probate is to create a trust and also to designate beneficiary designations wherever you can and and that's something that you can do on your own. And as Esther said, so beneficiary designations, if you don't designate beneficiaries on your retirement plans and life insurance, then those go through probate. So the the default uh, of of those uh, accounts that you have at those institutions, the default is that if you 
if you say a state or if you don't designate a beneficiary, then those assets go through the probate court process. And so the main, uh, one of the main things that I do in estate planning is try to help you to avoid probate and the, the fees and the uh, and the um, and also the publicity uh, around uh, around them. I of course handle probate cases uh, as I just told you with my radioactive house. But um, but you know we're, the main idea is that you are trying to help you avoid probate and the the pain of probate for also your your heirs and um, and if you if you don't have children, your relatives, or even if you want to make sure that your pets are taken care of. And. One of the things, we'll come back to the pets, because that's a very good point. Um, one of the things is I have, I would like your opinion on what is it when people designate their trust as either a primary or contingent beneficiary, and they have adult children. So there are complex rules around retirement plans, and uh, when a beneficiary uh, of a retirement plan uh, is a trust. So in, in for life insurance, I would I would recommend that if you're married to name the spouse as an individual um, as a as a primary beneficiary and then the trust as a secondary beneficiary. That's generally what I would recommend. And that's because the life insurance, the death benefits, um, and people don't realize this, but death benefits, they are not subject to income tax, but they're subject to a state tax. But unless you're worried about the estate tax and then we'll have to do something um, more advanced with regard to your, uh, your life insurance. But generally that, that would be what I would recommend for retirement plans because they are, they can be only owned by one individual at a time. And as you notice, uh, you can't own, even if you're married, you can't own asset the, that retirement plan together. You can't own them jointly. It has to be one individual at a time. And that's because the IRS uh, says w- when you open this retirement account, you have to have a birthday. You have to have, you have to be an in- individual with a birth date so that we can decide when you reach 70 and a half, you have to start taking out required minimum distributions. And so then the, the rules around who can h- inherit an IRA or a 401k uh, is also very complex. And so the, generally, I recommend that it would be the spouse as a primary beneficiary because the, the spouse is the only person who can roll over the retirement account and wait until 70 and a half to take out minimum, required minimum distributions. Um, and then the secondary should be um, individuals. It should be individual uh, it, children, if you have children, or individual relatives, if you have relatives. I also think that I, I also let my clients know that if you have charitable goals, that a beneficiary on an IRA of a charity or even to a donor advised fund is, is really uh, tax efficient because the charities don't pay income tax, whereas your beneficiaries on uh, traditional 401k and IRAs, they will pay income tax. And I have to say that the first one, we were laughing a lot, and this one is so technical. <laughs> so sorry about that. I'm, I'm hoping that it's useful, but it, it was. I'm sure that was a very technical answer. Well, it comes up a lot where, um, and I've seen this, where the trust is the contingent beneficiary and and it's confusing for clients because they I, I I mean again this just happened this week where they said well I I thought everything was in the trust I hear that over and over and over again and to go through and and I know their attorneys are explaining it but it's hard to retain this information so the, the IRAs are separate entity and so thank you so much for bringing me back to to the when a trust is a beneficiary. So when a trust is a beneficiary of an IRA, uh, there will be two, uh, two consequences to that. One is if the trust is not what, what is called a qualifying IRA trust uh, or conduit IRA trust, where you can stretch out the minimum distributions, um, uh, the, the beneficiary can stretch out the minimum di- uh, 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 distributions, then the retirement plan would have to be taken out by the trustee within five years, and then all the income taxes paid within five years. We, the trustee could wait until the fifth year, but it 
you know, the stretch out doesn't, um, it doesn't qualify, it doesn't qualify. The stretch, stretch out does not, is not available in that situation if the trust is not considered an individual or it doesn't have a qualifying IRA trust. The other, the, the other uh, way that a, a stretch out could happen for the beneficiary is that um, it, it, it does have a qualifying and, and it does have a conduit IRA trust. And, and I often put uh, these in, into the trust. However, it means that the trustee has to be uh, the trustee forever or for a lifetime because then the, life, the, the stretch out has to happen over the lifetime of the beneficiary. So it may be an expensive and, and, and not necessary uh, 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 goal of the client to have, a, uh, to, to have this continuing conduit IRA trust and all they really wanted was the child to have it. So it really, so going back, to, I don't, I don't mean to overwhelm people and, and, and uh, get them and, and, and have them not do the estate planning because they're overwhelmed by these concepts, but it, it is something that we, you should go to an estate planning attorney to discuss and to understand what the ramifications are and what your choices are with regard to the, uh, the beneficiaries. And generally, I would have to say it's better to name individuals on retirement plans. And that I'm saying generally, unless you have some asset protection or you have a special needs child and you need to accumulate income or you have some, you have a special need or a circumstance for doing that, I would say individuals are generally the best beneficiaries. Thank you. It, it, and, and by just what you've shared, uh, it's this is why we wanted to start with this issue of beneficiaries right out of the gate because it's something that is both simple and can be complex. But one of the things that both of us see is it gets neglected when people divorce, they can forget to change their beneficiaries. I had an example uh, of a client whose husband passed away. He had not made her the beneficiary of his IRA, even though they had been married for over 10 years. It had just always been neglected. So now it's another piece that's hanging out there uh, and needs a special treatment to get processed. She's a busy woman. It's just not getting done. I mean, it's just the hassle factor. So, um, and, and going back to the divorce. Yeah. Once once you are divorced, you should change the beneficiary designations because the whoever is on that uh, on that beneficiary designation form is the recipient. Mm-hmm. So just because you got a divorce, mm-hmm. it doesn't it. And that's a, a divorce decree is uh, issued by a state court, and retirement plans are are, are federally mandated. So the the federal plan doesn't have to follow the the state court divorce decree. So if you have still an, an, an ex-spouse on your retirement plan or your life insurance, but the divorce decree said, oh, it belongs to you, but you're the one who dies without changing the beneficiary designation, who guess who gets the, the asset when you pass away? Mm-hmm. It's the whoever is on the beneficiary designation form. I, I've, I've had millions of calls um, when somebody has died and they haven't updated the beneficiary designation forms um, and to, to be the proper beneficiary. So thank you for that reminder. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I want to touch a little bit on same-sex partners. All these things that we're talking about, are they applicable to same-sex partners as well as quote-unquote traditional? Yes, now they are. There was a time when uh, when we had to do all kinds of different things because California treated the same-sex married partners differently. Uh, So uh, the one thing that I would caution same-sex uh, partners around is that if you're just registered domestic partners, you don't have this, uh, the same privileges and the rights of married partners. And so what I often tell uh, my clients who come in and they think, they think they're okay, okay because they're just registered domestic partners, I'll tell them to get married and <laughs> mm-hmm. make it because... Um, because then you have all the rights and 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 then you have all all the things that you have to go through if you want to get divorced. It's, uh, so you know you have everything that you're you're entitled to. Yeah. So uh, it used to be harder, but now it's the planning is much much easier for same sex couples. EJ, if a couple are registered domestic partners and they are on title for their primary home together and they sell that home, are they entitled to the full exemption of 
capital gains tax, so from ta- capital gains tax, so 250000 per person? So as registered domestic partners, they would be protected by California law, but not federal law. They have to be legally married in order for them to be able to uh, uh, have uh, marital protection. So if they're selling a home, they each each uh, uh, owner has a $250,000 exclusion. So it wouldn't matter if they were married or not. But I just want to make a point that uh, uh, registered domestic partners are, they're California protected, but not federally protected. So on their federal income tax return, they would not be able to take the full 500 or they would as equal 250, 250. Exactly. So each yeah. of them would have 250, 250. Correct. Got it. Right. Okay. Thank you. So let's transition a little bit and talk about, you know, I'm getting married in a few weeks. And I have a living trust. And what would you recommend for someone like me who has a, a, a prior living trust that I created with my husband who is now deceased? So congratulations. Thank first you. Of all. And, uh, and, and so, they, so we talked about this a little bit. And it, it's important to, to discuss whether you want to get a prenup. Not everybody wants to get a prenup, but I think that it's a discussion that is good and healthy to have. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we talked about this a little bit too in our phone call, Esther. And I just want to bring that up. That and 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 that is, and I'm not sure this is the right place, but I'll just interject it now. And and that I had heard of uh, a, a suggestion being made that we should be having um, a financial date with right. our. our spouses or our partners and, and, and going over. And I know that sounds so unromantic, but it's really healthy to have. And, uh, what goes on in a financial date? So I think there should be a, uh, well, so going back to my, the first, uh, uh, the first segment of the podcast, and that is to be aware Mm -hmm. what I, what I see in uh, a lot of my, uh, widows uh, and some widowers is that they have no idea where, where, their accounts are. They have mm-hmm. no idea where the passwords are. They have no idea. They just have no idea where the financial statements are, where to go, or who to go to. And so, it's really important that each in in in, in my household, in our household, my husband is actually the person who does all the accounting, and he takes care of the bookkeeping uh, for the family. Uh, but I know exactly where all the assets are, and he, we have, uh, you know, we he knows to tell me where he, we have a place where we keep passwords, and so, um, and and we created um, a a Google Drive folder where the kids could access, and you know, it's basically this is where you go if if something happens to us, we if we die, mm-hmm. and so it's important that there's a, a, there's a discussion about you know and the financial goals. And, and and maybe it would be in conjunction with meeting with a financial planner. And, and so then you would talk about what what are the... Early on in the marriage, I remember somebody saying, you should write down your 10-year goal, 20-year goal. And, and I don't know if, you, if I, I, I should go back to those goals. But it should be, <laughs> you should have financial goals too. Absolutely, EJ. You, you're speaking to the choir with that. I love talking about financial goals with, with uh, partners coming into a new marriage. What else would you recommend for me with where, you know, we're getting married and we're later in life. It's not like when I got married the first time and we came together with basically a crock pot and a, <laughs> a 10 year old vehicles. It's a little bit different in life for both of us. And uh, we've accumulated some assets. What would, what would you recommend? So as part of the uh, prenup uh, planning or whether you do a, a formal prenuptial agreement or not is for you to be aware of the California community property rules and people think that uh, if you're if you get married that everything becomes community property, uh, but that's not true. Earnings and uh, wages during marriage are that's community property. If you don't have a prenup opting out of that, the default law in California is is that what you earn uh, during marriage is community property. And again, as I said, if you don't opt out of it through the prenup. Assets that you bring into the marriage, whether you have a prenup or not, that you keep separate, is separate as long as you keep it separate and you don't transmute it and you don't commingle assets. So the other thing I would want uh, you to think about and, and clients to think about in that situation is 
what do you want to keep separate? What do you want to keep community property? Uh, what agreements do you want to have around how you want your assets uh, to be used and who should it go to if anything happens to you? Uh, in particular, I think uh, a, a tricky situation is if one spouse owns a house and wants the other one to live in the house. And so I ask... To live in the house, should they should pass they, away? Exactly, mm-hmm. right. And so then I ask the hard questions like, okay, what if he... What if he trashes the house? What if he brings, what if, you know, I'm assuming that I'm, my client is a, a woman here because, right, we're talking about women mm-hmm. in transition. Yep. So what if you die first and your uh, your spouse, your partner, uh, your uh, your spouse decides that they're going to bring in other women and are you going to be okay with that? And if you, did you want the, the house to go to your children ultimately? So then should your children kick that person out? So it's, so mm-hmm. it's you know those are hard things to think about, and but I I ask the I ask the hard questions, and so that's something that you uh, that should I mean it's it's as I said it's not romantic, but it's something should that should be discussed. Yeah, I know going through the prenup process ourselves. I mean it's not romantic at all, but it is so important to get on the table, and uh, I just so appreciate that. Uh, that I can refer to individuals like you, professionals like you, who are willing to have those conversations. They really do need to get addressed. It falls under that category of things that we didn't think about in terms of the financial or other life decisions that we're making that could have an impact down the road. Um, One final example is what about, what about single, a single woman who has no kids why should she think about doing any estate planning? Right. So she's, you know, uh, you still have uh, relatives that you might be concerned about or charities. It, so if you don't name, the default law in California is is that if you don't name a, a beneficiary or if you don't have a will or a trust, that, that your assets will go to your heirs. And so it may be that you don't want it to go to your heirs and you may. And so if you want it to go to a charity like Prince, he wanted assets probably to go to charity, but he didn't write that in a will and it didn't. And so it's important to have an estate plan and and to also uh, create a team for yourself, professional team to take care of you uh, and to and to help you along the way in your in in your uh, estate um, and making sure that your estate planning is done correctly and your financial planning is also done correctly. Because it's true, it's not all about death, right? It's also about if you have a period of incapacity, who do you want to sign the check so that the mortgage gets paid? And I mean, that's a bit of an archaic term, but who do you want to handle things, right? Or if you're not able to make your health care decisions. Exactly. That's right. And And so it's really hard to think about the you know, these things, um, death, disability, divorce, and, and yeah, <laughs> so it's all, right. it's all these things that are, are hard to think about. And so what I tell my clients is that once you're done, once you're done making these hard decisions, then you can live and, and you can really live and you can leave, live uh, with peace and in peace. And, uh, and then you don't have to, you, you look at it every once in a while, but at least, you know, if anything were to happen to you and it's an emergency thing, it's like what I say in my, on my website it's insurance planning. If you need the insurance after a fire, you can't get the insurance. And so it doesn't mean that just because you get insurance that something's going to happen to you. you mm-hmm. Hopefully you won't need it. Uh, but if you do need it, then you have it. That's, is, so it's not, uh, it, shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't be a cause of uh, depression. And then, you know, on another fact that isn't a cause of depression, there's people who come into, in this area, we're a very tech-heavy area, people come into... Uh, a significant amount of wealth through the companies that they work with, through executive compensation, stock options, or um, being working with a company pre-IPO. Uh, what and more? It's you know RSUs, things like that. What do you recommend for those who all of a sudden, and maybe they've received an inheritance? That's another way. Uh, how do you address their estate planning in that case? What do you recommend? So uh, for business owners, if you're if you own a business, you should do the succession planning. You should make sure that if you something were to happen to you, that somebody else would take over your business uh, and and be able to distribute it according to the ways that you wanted it to be distributed. And if you're in a position where you are, it's a pre-IPO, it's a big event. You want to do some planning before the IPO, before the uh, stocks 
uh, appreciate. So I, I do a lot of that as well. And then, of course, if you have uh, if you if you have stock, yeah, and as you said, that you it, it vests over time, and you, you you want to make sure that those assets are handled in the right way, that it goes to the people whom you want it to, and it goes in it goes to the beneficiaries whom you have in mind in the most uh, tax efficient and administratively easy uh, pro- as, a way as possible then that's why you do an estate plan is because you want to make sure that there are the least fees that you'll pay and, and that it'll be administratively easy for the beneficiaries. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is that we have a lot of um, clients who are non-U.S. citizens, mm-hmm. and there are some special rules around non-U.S. citizen spouses as opposed to U.S. citizen spouses. And so that's a lot of the, the other planning, the type of planning that I do is around non-U.S. citizen spouses. Mm-hmm. Which is a whole other approach, but it's so, I mean, a whole other matter, but so critical to address as well. Um, the final thing that I'm going to ask about, you had mentioned pets before, and that is something that uh, we all remember, perhaps Leona Helmsley, who left a trust for her dogs to make sure they were being taken care of. She was a very wealthy woman on the East Coast. But um, what do you recommend for people so that they make sure that their pets are cared for after they've passed or maybe are unable to? So I think it's important to make sure that your pets are taken care of. I'm not sure that I'm a big fan of pet trusts because they actually... Uh, they the, uh, the taxes around pet trusts are going to be high, mm. it, and then, and you also have to have a trustee that you're managing. And what if the pet dies? And so mm-hmm. I would, I, I I I I think estate planning around pets is important though to make sure that they have a home and they go to the people whom you want them to go to, and that the people who are going to be taking care of your pets will have enough money to take care of them. And so there, I think it is important to. Uh, to address uh, your pets. Of course, if you have a tortoise, they're going to live forever. (laughs) Or a parrot. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, EJ, we have to wrap up now. If if, um, I just really appreciate all that you've shared with us. There's so many different facets, but I think you've touched on a lot today. If people need to get a hold of you, what are the best ways to reach you? So the best way is actually to email me to schedule an introductory phone call. And and so email me and uh, we can schedule a 15-minute introductory phone call where I learn about you and I can tell you if I'm the right attorney for you. And then I'll I'll explain the process and I'll I'll go ahead and explain the fees during that introductory phone call. And then you would decide whether you want to engage me or not. Very good. And your website is ejhong.com. That is correct. Thank you so much, EJ. Thank you so much. And thank you both. EJ, it has been wonderful to get to know you over these last two podcasts. And again, I'm just going to remind the audience, if you didn't hear the first one, please go back and listen to it. Full of great information. And again, Esther, thank you so much for bringing her on the show. Oh, I'm so pleased. So you're very welcome. Fantastic. And thank you all for listening to the Women in Wealth podcast with Esther Sabo. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Esther comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thanks for listening today. For everyone at Gates Pass Advisors, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Women and Wealth Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you receive notifications of new podcasts as they become available. Check out the website at www.gatespassadvisors.com for more information. This content is developed from sources believed to be providing accurate information. The information in this material is not intended as tax or legal advice. Please consult legal or tax professionals for specific information regarding your individual situation. The opinions expressed and material provided are for general information and should not be considered a solicitation for the purchase or sale of any security.